Hello, everybody. You're all very welcome. Already, we do know we have people joining from the US, from Australia and the UK and several other countries. And obviously, this event is happening at a very momentous time when there is a major national discussion and you might say a debate and not without a necessity is there debate happening because we're at a threshold where Irish foreign policy and Irish military policy and security policy is uh, being put in the spotlight and being pushed into certain corners and some might argue and indeed many here would argue that maybe not with the consent of the Irish people. So we'll be hearing lots of views on that in the coming moments. We have a great lineup of speakers and uh, I'll introduce them all one by one as we go, but I just want to say uh, again, you're all very welcome. And so special thanks to AFRI Action from Ireland for hosting this event. Uh, as long as I can remember, AFRI have been very much, uh, have had neutrality very much in their line of sight, uh, particular eye on Shannon Airport, Ireland's uh, role in the arms industry, and really kind of flying the flag for vigilance, for transparency, and for accountability, for keeping an eye on those that legislate and those that represent. So I'm going to bring on screen now uh, Joe Murray, who is the coordinator uh, of AFRI, and he'll maybe share a little bit more about what today is all about and what was the impulse and the inspiration for hosting. So you're very welcome, Joe. Thank you very much, Rory. And um, yeah, special thanks, Goramil Maigat, August Falcha, Riv Gokdena. And yeah, special thanks to Rory, who is actually joining us from Australia. So that's part of the international dimension to this launch. Tariq is also here and he's joining us from the US. Um, yeah, I uh, am coordinator with AFRI. And as Rory said, this has been a key issue of ours really since the beginning. And it probably began with our international. Uh, uh, patron, uh, Sean McBride, many years ago, who said, if you are concerned about hunger, then you must be concerned about war and the war industry. And I suppose that was our starting point, and we've always remained true to that advice. And to be honest, I can't um, understand how any agency involved in the kind of work um, that we're involved in, concern about hunger and poverty in the global south, does not include the war industry as part of their issues. And sadly, that's lacking in, in many organizations. So I hope that this will be a wake up call to people, you know, involved in, in global development issues that we cannot ignore the horror of war and the impact of war on particularly the poorest people in, in our world. Um, we're here to launch this book um, today, and I, I, you know I'm very proud that AFRI have published this book, and you will be hearing from many of the contributors today. And it is really it's a key issue. You know we have been brought away from a, a proud tradition of neutrality against the will of the people, brought by a process of deception and deceit and subterfuge by successive governments, particularly the current government. And I suppose to sum up and, and to finish uh, before we get on with the, the, the speakers, I think, you know, what sums up the um, journey that we have traveled against our will is the fact that Frank Aiken in the 1950s, 60s, gave us the non-proliferation treaty. And Michal Martin, the leader of Fianna Fáil today, will have us lock our arms with NATO. That's the journey we have come. We have come against our will. We have been brought here by deceit, and it's time that this was exposed. And this book is part of that process of exposing the uh, the journey that we've been brought on against against our will. So um, we have many good speakers today. So I'm not going to take up any more time. I'm going to hand back to you, Rory, to start uh, the the book launch proper. And thank you again to everyone our panel and those who are attending. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, good to get a little bit of the historical context there as well. And I think that journey is very much um, still ongoing. Um, like what you're seeing in the, in the past few days is almost a groundswell of resistance and 
uh, the, the people really speaking against perhaps what some narratives are coming through in the media and elsewhere, there's a real sense of Irish people caring deeply about neutrality and that is starting to come to the fore and you can see it in the interest in this event. There was a big event last night, which some of our speakers spoke at, at uh, Liberty Hall in Dublin. And I don't think we're going to have heard the last of this by a long shot, is that there's almost like a reawakening of the Irish people's uh, spirit of peace and what we should stand for in the world. And I, I think those sentiments are, are being shared by lots of people joining us today. I see we've people from Monaghan, Tralee, West Clare, Limerick, uh, Westport, uh, Kildare, Ballycastle, County Antrim, Booterstown, Waterford, um, Port Rush. So north and south and east and west, it's, uh, it's great to have you all here. So we'll move it along here and I'm going to introduce our first speaker. It's uh, Dr. Karen Devine. She's a lecturer in international relations, specializing in teaching European Union politics, Irish foreign policy and international relations theories and methodologies in DCU. Her research interests include the politics and neutrality of Ireland or in Ireland, uh, Austria and former neutral countries of uh, Sweden and Finland and the ever-growing relationship between uh, the European Union and NATO. Uh, so Karen's going to speak about her contribution to the book and in particular also give reference to Irish foreign policy under uh, Frank Aiken, as Joe mentioned already, from the 1950s and 60s and how things have changed up until this point today. So uh, you're very welcome, Karen. Thank you very much, Rory. Uh, thanks very much for hosting this all the way from Australia and also to Joe Murray of AFRI, everyone in AFRI for uh, producing this great book and to all of my co-presenters. Um, it's an honor to be in your company today. Um, so, so, and thanks to everyone who's, who's logging on to listen um, at this really important time in relation to Irish neutrality. So I just have a few things to say um, about uh, so the history um, that led up to Frank Aiken's policies at the UN, and then specifically a few points and quotes to make in relation to how Frank Aiken's policy at the UN can be applied to the conflict in Ukraine today. Um, so the ethos of Ireland's sort of pre-independence peace policy was established within very early discourses of Irish foreign policy, and those are explained by Ireland's history. So there was pivotal Irish leaders' discourses and practices, for example, Theobald Wolftone in the 1700s, Daniel O'Connell in the 1800s, Podrick Pierce, James Connolly, Sean Lester in the early 1900s. And they suggested that people subjected to slavery, oppression, starvation, colonization, war for centuries are those who are most determined to realize a genuinely peace promotive foreign policy. And so Ireland's post-independence official ethos of peace policy is found in the discourses of the Minister for Foreign Affairs, Frank Aiken, and the Taoiseach, the Prime Minister of Ireland, Eamon de Valera, during the, the mid-1900s. And it was during this era that Irish peace policy was driven as much by ideas and norms as by survival and material interests. And in fact, the 1916 Proclamation of Independence was essentially saying that peace norms and survival are constitutive. One depends on the other for Ireland. And Ireland's early UN policy explicitly subordinated material interests to moral and justice based ideas to achieve peace. And there's remarkable consistency of the ethos and elements of peace policy in the discourses and practices of all of those leaders that I mentioned across several centuries. But there was two key periods in the 1960s and in the early 2000s when this consistency was broken and policy was reversed in the context of Ireland's pursuit of membership of the EEC in the 60s. And then this new European Union that was rendered legal through the Lisbon Treaty um, in the 2000s. So it was against this background of deeper integration that successive Irish uh, Taoiseach um, pushed through treaties, the Maastricht, Amsterdam, Nice and Lisbon treaties, and basically reconfigured relations with the United Nations and undertook 10 reversals of the traditional elements of Ireland's foreign and peace policy. And this is done against public opinion and, and NGOs um, preferences. So public opinion NGOs continue to resist this. 
Um, so, um, you know, there was key signifiers in, in, in speeches of uh, leaders, independence, self-determination, uh, global cosmopolitanism, anti-colonialism, anti-imperialism. All of these were basically omitted in later Irish leaders' discourses on foreign policy because of their desire for Ireland to become a member of the EC. Um, and in response to pressures to join NATO and engage in power projection through a European foreign policy identity. So Frank Aiken actually played a very large role in the UN, similar to what De Valera did at the League of Nations. Uh, he was the last military commander of the anti-treaty forces in 1923, but his heart wasn't in the civil war. And he managed to reconcile the army to a new regime and persuaded old enemies to cooperate. And he repeated the same feet in uniting the country behind neutrality during World War II. And it was his conciliatory nature and his ability to put aside feelings of ill will, uh, for example, stemming from US hostility to Ireland's neutrality. And it meant he never took an anti-US or an anti-British line at the UN. Uh, but at the same time, he was reluctant to be intimidated by big powers in the pursuit of peace. He had confronted British military might, so he was hardly intimidated by a UN member being offended by an unexpected Irish vote or initiative, um, whether it was the US or the UK. Um, and so my contribution to the AFRI book um, had two aims, and it was based on Franken's, uh, Frank Aiken's policies at the UN. It was firstly to explain why Ireland's neutrality-based foreign policy approach is such an, a valuable resource in the realm of international relations and the promotion of peace. And the second was to highlight how Ireland's framework and plans to secure peace in Europe put forward by Frank Aiken at the UN um, in the 50s and 60s would serve as a blue print uh, to essentially uh, re resolve the current UK Ukraine crisis. Um, and Ireland's neutrality was the foundation to enable this very important independent what, what was called a bloody maverick position at the UN. And to the present day, Irish ambassadors explain that most UN member states are small states. Many of them are former colonies. And it's these states who identify with Ireland's size and history and resonate with Ireland's commitment to the rule of law, equality, justice, and multilateralism. And it's an important point to make in relation to the contemporary context of the Ukraine crisis, because Frank Aiken believed that a small neutral state had a crucial role to play in UN diplomacy, but this is not shared by recent regimes of Irish governments. So, um, as I said, he had a very, very uh, interesting set of plans. Um, I've literally got two minutes left. Um, so what he wanted to do, essentially the, the principal components of Frank Aiken's proposal um, was an area of law. So he wanted a specific region or zone where neighboring states would agree to limit their arms below what he called blitzrig level and to exclude foreign troops from their territories and to accept the supervision by the United Nations in the fulfillment of those conditions. So the principal elements of Frank Aiken's proposals were the elimination of colonialism, spheres of influence, imperialist empire building by the great powers and their funding, arming and subsidization of weaker peoples in relation to in relation to proxy wars. And also, as he said, their hateful propaganda campaigns. So he wanted to introduce nuclear weapon free zones, safety zones and the areas of law that I talked about underpinned by the neutrality of the surrounding states and bolstering the independence and determination of buffer states with disarmament agree agreements policed by the United Nations and the use of peacekeeping forces to safeguard all of that. Um, so he rejected proxy wars between state or non-state actors instigated by the big powers. Um, and I've only sort of 30 minutes, 30 seconds left, but um, just to say that um, he said that the smaller states in the area of law and safety should declare their neutrality. Um, and arguably, that's exactly what should happen in relation to the Ukraine. He said states can play their part if the desire to do so by declaring the neutrality, which the great powers in the United Nations should guarantee. So applying Aiken's strategy to the present crisis, you, Ukraine should redeclare neutrality, reject involvement in either the Russian and Western political or, orbits, 
And this is a democratically supported path because opinion polls show that a neutral democratic peaceful Ukraine um, supported in its resistance to the influence of either Russia or to the east or the western powers on the other flank is what the people in Ukraine want um, in the east and the west. And it's this foundation of this path of respect for self-determination of the people of Ukraine, which is a core value of Aiken's Dayton plans and Ireland's wider approach to the functioning of the international system and the United Nations. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Karen. Could listen to you all day. That was fascinating, absolutely fascinating. Um, and we're getting some more comments and new people joining us all the time. And I encourage you to ask some questions if you want in the chat. You can uh, you can comment in there, but there's also a specific Q and A function you'll see at the bottom of the screen. And if we have time, we'll try and field some questions to some of our speakers today as well. So thanks again, Karen. That was absolutely uh, enlightening, as John agrees there in the in the comments. So we'll move along, and our next speaker is. Um, is Thomas Pringle. He's an independent TD for Donegal. Thomas has been a strong and consistent advocate, I would say, for Ireland's neutrality. And he initially hosted the, uh, the launch in Dáil Éireann off a force for good reflections on neutrality and the future of Irish defence. I think he's, he's um, a great representative, um, not just for Donegal, but for Ireland. And I think he's over in Strasbourg, joining us from Strasbourg today. Um, yeah. So you're very welcome, Thomas. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Rory, and thanks for the uh, introduction there. And um, and uh, like you say to um, Karen, we could listen to Karen for ages, and I would be quite happy to give her some of my time because I I, I won't use it all to um to today. So first of all, I would like just like to thank Afri for the invitation to, to the launch here for Force for Good, and I think it's it's great to have uh, the launch in, in the doll, but also then a, a launch on, online too, and, and it shows, I suppose. Um, the beauty of Zoom, in, in some senses, it hasn't got much to recommend it, but I think the the one advantage is that I am in, in Strasbourg, as Rory said today, at the uh, uh, Council of Europe meetings this week, and um, there is other members or other people participating here in the launch from all over the world, so it's a really international um, uh, panel that we have here as well, which is which is very good, I think, as well. Um, I, I think a force for good makes a vital contribution to the to the current debate on neutrality, and it is timely when we see the so-called consultative forum, which is, is taking place at the, at the moment as well. And uh, I think it, it is a bit worrying as well that it's left to Afri to publish a book in order to have an alter, alternative voice published, because um, I think that alternative voice is very important and more even more so uh, in the current climate. And we have we've seen in recent days that the, in the makeup of the consultative forum that the alternative voice has been left outside the mainstream, and I suppose that that is probably naturally true, but. Maybe alternative as well, I think, is probably is the wrong word because uh, the government and established establishment position is actually the alternative in the context of what the Irish people want from our own security. And I think this is evident by any one of the polls that have been done in recent years that show strong public support for neutrality. So the government is is putting forward the the, the non popular voice and the, uh, and the alternative. So and I think it is more and more clear as the war in Ukraine and the consequent militarization of the EU has shown that citizens all around Europe as well are concerned as to what their governments and ruling classes are doing. The use of our soft power is something that has been un under underestimated by the political class, and it has placed Ireland in a unique role of being able to bridge the gaps between the global south and the former colonial powers of Europe and the and the power of the US as well, to a certain extent. And as Karen has said, it is, it is that bloody maverick role that Ireland should be very proud of, I think, and should be um, looking to, to develop more, and particularly in, in face of the militarization of the EU and that as well, too, as being um, one of the few uh, neutral voices within the European Union that should be actually developing that role further. And I think this, this could be used to develop and used to grow our importance more than, than ever could be envisaged by us being a minor cog in the militarized wheel of the EU or NATO. And um, and even more cynically, I think the ruling classes in Ireland see the potential for Ireland to grow foreign direct, direct investment in one of the few growth areas left of military equipment and dual use material. 
And uh, could the move to be be the end of our neutrality be as cynical as that? Unfortunately, I think it could. And um, and I suppose we can't underestimate the potential to make money out of the misfortune of other states. Um, I think the contributors to the book, who are some of them are here, are very important, very important voices that should be heard. And I think it's uh, thanks to, to AFRI, they, they will be heard as well in, in the debate. And I think it is a sad indictment of the political class in this country that they will not be put forward by the government in the debate, because if they were sure of their argument and the validity of what they were saying, they would include the voices of those who promote neutrality and peace as well. In a democracy, citizens should make decisions, having, decisions on having heard all of the facts. But I suppose that, again, at the point, citizens won't be given the, choice, the voice in this argument because Fianna Fáil, Finn Gael and the Greens cannot trust them to make the right decision when they, when they have got the facts. And, um, you know, Karen, Karen did say in, in, in the rocks today as well that neutrality was a prerogative at a certain time. And it is interesting when you hear Karen's talk on that as well about how the, the use of neutrality has become silent over the last number of years with the, the further EU integration. Um, so we're we're involved in a process of very slow drawn out and undermining of our neutrality. And unfortunately, I believe that in a few years' time, we'll wake up in the middle of NATO and, we'll, and people will say, how did we end up here? Uh, and, and that is government strategy, and that is that is where the government would like to see us going. And um, that in itself is sad too, because I think it shows that uh, the at least, at least uh, as stages to say this, I know, but at least if the if the people had a, were fully informed and made a decision to do away with their neutrality, you would have no choice but to live with it. But um, we're not even going to be given that option and, and given that alternative. And what's, what is happening will be a complete undermining and undermining till eventually it will be a situation where we're here and there and that's it. And that's a done, we're presented with a done deal. And that that is really sad. So that's, I think that's why this book is, is very important to uh, to counteract that, and um, I'm actually I've actually started reading that other book that was published recently as well. To their um, I can't remember the I blanked out the name the name the name, the name of it, but it's about neutrality and, and and it actually goes a long way to showing to strengthen Karen's argument in relation that neutrality was a prerogative of certain times. But I think neutrality will always be a prerogative of certain times, and it's always it's always going to be a prerogative that's going to evolve and develop, and and it's going to have different reasons and different strengths at different times as well. And that's something that we should be prepared for, and that we should be, be quite happy to go along with. But I think the one thing that under that should undermine everything is and should underscore everything that we do is that it should it mark out our difference and it mark out our responsibility on an international stage to actually to be maybe to be a bridge between the former colonial powers and the, and the power and the countries that are coming out of, of and have seen the detriment of all the wars that, that take place but also of the colonial influence as well too and I think that's a very important role and something we should be quite happy to play and um, so and I'll wrap up now and just say that it's, it's a great honour for me to be here as part of this launch and as, uh, I think it's very important and um, it's a debate that hopefully will get some um, more traction and we'll actually have some realistic debate and we might even see the the media picking up on it and i think that's from that point of view i think the the president's intervention um, last week was very welcome because it actually forces the media to actually cover the issue and to give it uh, um, maybe a more balanced view as well too which is important so um look i would, i think the book is a great success and i think it should continue on and hopefully over the coming um, weeks and that it'll inform a lot of people's decisions and and in relation to our neutrality and the importance of defending it as well. So thanks very much, Rory, and thank you. Thanks very much, Thomas. Uh, really appreciate it, and best of luck uh, with the rest of your time in Strasbourg there. Thank you, Thomas. Um, so we will move it along. Um, we have a special guest who unfortunately can't be with us, so she she's going to be joining us uh, via, I suppose, a video message, but more so uh, a message that she's already imparted to a previous AFRI event, but uh, rest assured it is a really, really powerful piece and well worth watching again. It's just a few minutes long and it's by none other than Mairead uh, Maguire, who, as you may know, is the founder of the Peace People in the North and a Nobel Peace Prize winner, great friend of AFRI. Um, Mairead knows the effect of violence, I suppose, firsthand and founded the Peace People uh, following the death of her sister and three children 
by what I suppose was described at the time as a careering car after its driver and a member of the IRA had been shot dead at the wheel by British uh, soldiers. So this is a short excerpt and it's taken from Raid's contribution to a recent Afri Freyla Bridge conference. We have to say as a human family, we're not afraid. We uphold the right for every single man, woman and child not to be killed. And we have not to be afraid. We mustn't allow our governments to say that we have arms that are going to protect us. Look around the world. Arms, nuclear weapons, wars, they leave behind them heartbreak and, and tragedy with so many families. But we can do this another way. Mm. And Ireland's message to the world should not be letting American soldiers go through the lack of Shannon. It should not be denying its neutrality and selling its soul at the United Nations in order to be the flavour of the month. Ireland is letting its people down by denying its neutrality. And in Northern Ireland, when the Good Friday Agreement was signed, everyone, including the Irish government, the British government, the, the different paramilitary groups, we all signed on to solve our problems through dialogue and negotiation. What have they done? They sold that down the river. People must stand up and hold their word. We rejected violence when we signed the Good Friday Agreement and the Irish people rejected violence when they signed on for neutrality. They did not sign up to be part of the military industrial complex I have been to a lot of countries in the world that have that pleasure as privilege as a Nobel laureate. And you know, everywhere the problem is violence. Violence. It is time militarism. We have to abolish militarism. We need the money out of militarism to feed the hungry, to take care of the poor, to do education. The way our governments are now militarizing Europe we're going down the road of Europe becoming part of the military industrial allegiance. And we're asked to pay for it. And you know, here in the streets of Belfast, there's people going to food banks. I mean, if Bridget was here today, how angry she would be that people go to food banks and can't turn on the heating to warm their little children because the money is going to nuclear weapons and war and militarism. And we're accepting it. Where's the voice of the people to say, no, feed the hungry, take care of the poor, get them houses, get them off the streets. Where's the Irish voice in this? Because if we've anything to say to the world, it must surely be what Bridget Patrick Columkill talked about, peace, peace, disarmament. And we're, we're remaining silent. We're bowing down to all this nonsense of not being able to talk to each other, work with each other, challenge policies. It's not about the politicians as much as the policies. The policies have to change. And the policy must be, first and foremost, feed the hungry, take care of the poor. We do need hungry people in a rich world. So violence, Violence is the enemy. The violence of dehumanization. We're allowing our, our societies to become dehumanized. And who tells us we must be enemies to the Russian people? I was in Russia years ago. They are good people. They want peace. We must not allow any more wars, false wars. And, and after I was in Iraq when I seen over half a million young children died in Iraq of starvation in absolute agony because the UN and America decided they would put on sanctions to punish young kids. It's not acceptable. It's not good enough. We have to take a stand or civilization will get destroyed. 
Very, very powerful, um, Mairead Corrigan Maguire there. And uh, I see um, some of the comments coming in about Mairead. So thanks, Nicholas, for commenting and everyone else for joining us. And uh, I see Rob's comment on Karen. Why is Karen not a key contributor to the government's consult consultative forum? Very good question indeed. So I'll remind people that you're obviously free and welcome to comment. And then there's a Q&A section as well. I'll try and keep an eye on those as well. Um, so I will invite on our next speaker and then I'll have a look at those questions to see what we can get to. Uh, and apologies in advance if we do not get to those questions. So uh, our next guest is John McGuire. Uh, he is Emeritus Professor of Sociology at UCC. He's the author of Defending Peace, Ireland's Role in a Changing Europe. Uh, that was Cork University Press 2002. And he is a board member of AFRI. He's also a longtime writer and activist on the betrayal of Irish neutrality, particularly the misuse of Shannon Airport and against the militarization of the EU. So, John, you're very, very welcome. Um, I'll bring you on screen momentarily. There you are. Thank you very much, uh, Rory. Uh, and thank you, uh, everyone, for joining us. Um, so uh, there's so much that could be said, and I sometimes get hot under the collar, try to cram in too much. So I'll just give myself a few points up to the eight minutes. Uh, it's daunting, but it's wonderful to follow uh, Maraith Maguire. Unfortunately, no relation. but relation is what she does because she related what we have achieved on this island imperfect but it, a, a significant achievement in our peace process and she's related it to the world outside there the world that ireland is increasingly neglecting in our foreign policy a world of terrible suffering and a world of immense strength which is actually turning away from uh, the uh, defective choices that Irish foreign policy has made in recent decades, uh, forgetting the kinds of values Karen uh, was uh, describing and talking about uh, from Frank Aiken. Um, this is really part of, a, it's a rolling event. It follows on from a hard copy launch of the booklet. Um, and uh, it, it also comes the day after a wonderful event where two of our contributors, Karen, uh, and Carol Fox, whom you'll hear from uh, shortly, where they uh, uh, began, they, they helped us at one of the people's forums yesterday uh, to uh, realize the depth of the challenge we're facing. And it's wonderful that Thomas, who launched us, who helped launch us in the hard copy, is with us. It's so important uh, that our legislators, uh, uh, some of them at least, are prepared to try to uh, buck the trend. And he quite rightly uh, mentioned um, President Michael D. And a lot of people have been saying uh, in the last several days that Michael D. should stick to his job, that Michael D. isn't doing his job. Michael D. is doing exactly his job. But the sad part of it is that Michael D. is doing something that Mairead has just reminded, of, uh, reminded us of. Michael D. is doing our job which we have failed to do. He hasn't just enabled us wonderfully by his intervention, but he has challenged us very, very profoundly. Uh, I'm going to do something risky now. If it's possible to show that mad cartoon I thought of this morning, if it's possible to screen share it, uh, it's something that came to me after the People's Forum uh, yesterday, or oh, it's a bit missing in the middle, or oh, it, may, it may come up anyway. And this is an image that I got uh, 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 thinking over it all from last night's meeting, we have uh, on the left-hand side, as you look at it, what has happened, Karen has told us a lot about that last night, what has happened our uh, defence forces as they have become involved with the NATO-inspired EU policies, common foreign and security policy, and something that, and by the way, that's been going on as the top corner shows since 1961 and before. They were ready to settle for NATO even then in their mad rush not to be left out of the EEC and then EU. And the, the column there, you might call it a military column, I've drawn that because despite what uh, 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 Thornish Hall Martin is telling us, 
Uh, NATO is imprinted right through all our policies, right through our structures, uh, like y'all in a stick of rock. Tarek may already know that y'all is a well-known seaside resort here. I think he already likes the Southeast. And as you have y'all, for example, through a stick of rock, we have NATO through all of what has already happened in Irish defense policy, something Carol may well uh, develop and I'm not going to expound on now. What hap what's happening then? Over on the right, you have a ramshackle structure, uh, a structure under a lot of strain, and that is Bunrocht Neheran, our fundamental law, our constitution. Why is it ramshackle now? Why does it need to be restored? Why do we need to do our job and reclaim it? Because of the events that have been happening over on the left side of my diagram, real events. Our defense forces already are reconfigured away from the United Nations. They've already taken on what some of the smart suited young men who come to all these seminars will describe as gear or kit or whatever for kinetic action. Already those armaments are being taken on by our uh, defense, you know, I hope they're still defense forces. Uh, and of course, they're now talking about setting up more of an armaments industry here. The tank there is a tank that already exists and that has been driven into and has fired at the constitution. That's why our constitution, Bunroth Neheran, is so ramshackle. If you look at it, it's wonderful. We have one of the significant but not majority number of our legislators, Thomas, with us, those who don't go along with the pressures that have been exercised by government through the Doyle and Shannon down on the people. And it took Michael D to remind us of Article 6, that the people are the sovereign. That's not just a pretentious privilege that we have, that's a solemn duty, not to forget our own peace in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, in the Downpatrick Declaration, which is reprinted in our booklet, uh, and of which, of course, Mairead, with her wonderful address today and on so many other occasions, is a primary signatory. So I'm going to stop with just one image, and that image is what Mairead and what President Michael D. Higgins have reminded us of. I don't often go for sporting analogies, but I'll go for one. Back in a crucial time in the mid 1980s, that's when the single European act was being hatched and that's where the whole rot began to set in. A rot that we can reverse, but it's our job to do it. And there was a, a rugby match, I wasn't at it, but there was a rugby match between Ireland and, surprise, surprise, England, and Ireland were losing. And there's a very famous, you'll find it on YouTube, Kieran Fitzgerald, the captain. It was near the end of the match. And Kieran Fitzgerald apparently walked up to the forwards. I think they're the fellows who get down in the scrum. I've never been sure. I went to a rugby playing school, but I went home early. Uh, and Kieran Fitzgerald walked up to his forwards. And he said, where is your flipping pride? Or he may have used a slightly different word. Where is your flipping pride? And it turned out that they got into the match and with the drop kick, they won. Now we're near an end game at the moment, the end game of the government's machinations. We need to restore our pride. But it's not just a matter of pride. We need to do our job our job for the peace we've made so far in Ireland, our job for the peace that a suffering and strong world demands of us. And I'll finish with an old slogan. There's one of the uh, old, old poems uses the poetical image of Ireland, Banba. Some of us will be old enough to know the Banba brass and reed band. Well, uh, there's a saying, Muskel the Vishnuch of Anba, awaken your courage, O Ireland. And I would add to that, Muskel the Nyodrocht of Anba, awaken your neutrality, Ireland. Thanks very much. Thanks so much, John. Very, very passionate address as always. Uh, very much appreciated, John. Thank you. Um, so we are moving along at pace here, folks. Um, we only have about 20 minutes left and thanks to everybody for joining us and staying with us 
Um, so looking at the program, we have two more speakers. And uh, next up, we have Carol Fox. Carol was born in the US, but has lived in Ireland most of her life. She's been a lifelong anti-nuclear and peace activist and is a member of PANA, the Peace and Neutrality Alliance. She previously worked with John Gormley as a researcher for the Green Party for a number of years. And I'm told she is a proud member of the Dublin Ukulele Band, which no doubt is spreading or doing its work for peace in the world. So, uh, Carol, I'll just get you to unmute and uh, the floor is yours. Hey, thank you very much. And thanks to AFRI for organizing this and for publishing this really important book. Um, I would maybe I should play the ukulele. Um, could sing a peace song, and it might help things along. But I think we're going to end on a peace song, thankfully. Um, as I tell some people, I'm kind of strumming while Rome burns, but I'm not. We're doing this as well, I'm trying our best to to protect Irish neutrality. Um, the road show has now begun for, for the forum, uh, which I referred to last night as the government spring offensive. And uh, thankfully, Michael D. Higgins has thrown a bit of a spanner in the works. And this is becoming more of a debate because it certainly is not a debate as put out on the forum program. Um, the contribution that I made to the booklet was very much about the impact that uh, the arms industry is having on Ireland's progression towards, towards NATO and towards closer EU military cooperation. Um, the, the government has already had two arms fairs. It had one during COVID in 2021 um, to look at disruptive uh, technologies, as they call it. And at the time, Simon Coney was saying how there is great uh, possibilities for Irish industry, for access to weapons, for, for access to new markets to, to help produce uh, military hardware. Uh, and then uh, a bit upset by the fact that their arms fair was held during COVID and they couldn't all mingle and get to know one another a bit better. Uh, last year at the Aviva Stadium, um, Simon Coveney held a second arms conference. And the incredible thing about a lot of this is the language being used. Uh, the arms conference was, was called uh, Helping the Ecosystem. Now, um, AFRI organized a really good protest outside the Aviva Stadium about that conference, but I see that the terminology, the ecosystem has continued in that the forum, when it's being held in Galway, is having a section called Irish Research and Innovation in Security and Defense. And it says we are involved in various areas of security and defense related research and innovation. What does the current ecosystem in Ireland for this work look like? And what are the main areas of focus? Uh, and it goes on and it's the moderator is somebody from the Department of Defense and they have people from the number of defense, defense research institutes involved. It's the bizarreness, the Orwellian use of language constantly. How on earth producing weapons uh, is going to assist the ecosystem or what it has anything to do with other than destroying the ecosystem. And uh, it's been pointed out that about 550 firms in Ireland are already involved in, in defense related um, industry uh, and that our dual use exports in 2019 actually uh, went up to 2.4 billion, which is more than the beef that we export. So this is all continuing, this, this idea of in, in, you know, increasing Irish enterprise industry is all part of this move away from our neutrality. Something they cannot say, but it, it is, it's definitely going on. Um, as I say, the terminology used, we're told we're still neutral. We're neutral, but we cooperate and have a partnership with a nuclear alliance. We go on exercises with them and we're trying to get all our weapons interoperable with NATO as well. So it all is, is, is developing towards 
the government having this forum, which uh, we all know what they hoped was going to happen, that what the only results of the forum were, were to be to decide what pace the government would go in order to implement the defense decisions it's already made. And it was also designed in order to help the messaging of when the government did go ahead and, and make these decisions. So all I can say is we have to keep our eyes on what's going on. I think that Michael D has helped us incredibly. His behavior, I think, has been right with the Irish constitutions. We know Article 29 of the Irish constitution says that Ireland should be devoted to the, to the peaceful settlement of disputes. That is obviously not the direction we are going in. And I'm going to end there because I know we are running out of time. And I want to very much listen to my good friend, Tarek, uh, who's in New York City, I think at the moment. And uh, again, to thank you all and to thank AFRI for holding this, um, this seminar. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Carl. And uh, that was excellent. Thank you so much. So um, we have one more speaker to join us. And as Carol said, it is Tarek. He's joining us early in the morning from the US. Tarek Kauf is a former US Army paratrooper who served from 1959 to 1962. He is a member of Veterans for Peace, the managing editor, editor of Peace in Our Times, um, which is uh, VFP's quarterly newspaper. And was, he was a member of the VFP National Board of Directors for six years. Tarek is a staunch defender of Irish neutrality, seeing it as a beacon of hope for the world. So thank you, Tarek, for joining us all the way from the US. And we'll get you to unmute there and I'll bring you on screen. You're very welcome. Thank you so much and thank you, everybody. I am so incredibly honored and grateful to be here, to be even with, with you people, because I admire all of you and admire so much what you stand for and what you've said. So I wanna think about <clears throat> the topic that we're, we're speaking under, you know, which is neutrality or NATO. And I want to think about what that really means, what neutrality means and what NATO means. And it, it's an or, isn't it? So it's a choice between one or the other. I, I don't think, I think it's obvious we can't have both. You can't have neutrality and, and NATO at the same time. So what does neutrality mean? Neutrality to me means a valuing of peace, a valuing of community, a valuing of people being able to eat, being able to have their homes, being able to have a community, valuing the earth itself. It's so important. It means so much. The more you think about what neutrality means, what it really means, the more important it becomes. And it becomes this alternative to what NATO stands for. What does NATO stand for? You know, they talk about, many people think, well, NATO is a defensive organization. NATO will protect us. NATO is set up for killing. NATO is set up for violence. You cannot solve anything with killing. I'm trying to keep my emotions down so I don't get carried away, but it's something, this is something I feel very passionate about. And I'm, going to talk about why I feel so passionate about it. But NATO, NATO and the United States are literally destroying this planet. It is not only the wars. It is everything that the military does. They are literally destroying life on Earth. So we are faced, we're at a precipice right now. This is not, we don't have a lot of time because they are doing it so quickly and so absurdly powerfully, and Ireland cannot fall into this. Ireland is a, like a last bastion of hope for the world, because Ireland is a European country. Not only that, and, and NATO and the US know this, not only that, Ireland happens to be an English-speaking country, aside from Gaelic, but <clears throat> which is your real home language. But 
Ireland's an English speaking country, which is what the US is and which is what the UK does, is. So if Ireland can stand up and stand strongly for neutrality and make it an active, proactive neutrality, not just, oh, we're, neut we're neutral, we're not gonna be involved in your wars, but what we stand for is the opposite of your wars, the opposite of militarism. So I wanna, I wanna I'm, I'm thinking about what Mairead said. Mairead's talk was so incredibly moving. I, I was almost in tears listening to her. But she said something very profound. She said, we must take a stand or civilization will be destroyed. These words are literally true. They are literally true. That's, that's how urgent the situation is. That's how urgent it is that our Irish neutrality is not just for Ireland. That's why I'm passionate about it. That's why I came over to Shannon Airport to stand as a U.S. veteran and went through all of that, you know. And I would do it again and again and again if it would be effect if it would be effective. So, <clears throat> Irish neutrality, to me, and Ireland standing for neutrality and proactively standing for neutrality, for what it really means is it's important to the to the global community it is so important let's just think about it if ireland goes the way of nato if ireland goes the way of nato that means the entire european continent is basically nato it means they have won that's the end that's really the end it means they have won and if they've won, we all lose, including them. That there's an insanity here. They don't realize, you know, what's going on with the weapons and the war and all of it that's connected to that. There's so much connected to it. But on the other hand, if Ireland says no, if Ireland says <clears throat> no, not only will we not be part of this, but we oppose this because this is wrong. Ireland has a very powerful voice as a European country. And Ireland happens to be very respected around the world, specifically for the resistance of the people for these hundreds of years, for centuries, resisting British domination, resisting. And that's very important. And when I, I don't know how much time I have, but uh, I want to get to something that I feel is critical. You all, and I know so many people in, in Ireland, Ed Horgan, John Lannan, the, the names go on and on, people that I respect enormously, people that are leaders, people whose voices are just profound and their, their commitment is profound. So you have the leadership, but there's something else that you also have, which is extremely important, which needs to be used. It is a tool that has to be used. It is the most powerful tool that you have. And if this tool is used, we will win. We will, we will establish something. You will have neutrality. If it is not used, you will lose. I guarantee that. That's the issue. This tool is the people themselves. The people. You have the people who support neutrality. Oh, my God, we don't have that in the United States. We don't have that kind of commitment. We don't have that kind of except for the Native Americans and, and Black people, we don't have that kind of spirit of resistance, which I felt when I was in Ireland. I could feel it in the ordinary people. It's still there. It is really still there. It has not been drummed out of the people yet. So the people need to be motivated. And you will have to break some rules. You will have to break some rules according to the rules that the government sets for you. You can't do this. You can't do that. And Michael D. Higgins, God bless him. He has broken some rules. And God bless his wife originally for standing up and taking the heat that she did. They have shown the way. They have broken rules. You need to break rules because you need to save this planet. We need to save this planet. I mean, it is so precious to us. Life, the children, the animals the earth itself, Ireland, 
that, that island, that beautiful island. And, and the people love this. They love the, the island. They love the earth. They love all of it. These are good people. They need to be motivated. They need to be out in the streets. The people need to be in the streets. They need to stop business as usual. This is the only thing that your government will listen to. The only thing that maybe the government will listen to, but the people need to be roused. You have the leadership, you have the philosophy, you have everything. You are right. You are 100% right. And the world, the world is looking at this like it's a schoolyard. This whole thing is like a schoolyard. And there's a bully in the schoolyard. There's a bully. That bully is NATO. That bully is the government. That bully is, is the United States with all its wealth and militarism. And all its, it, we function, the United States functions because of war. That's what we do. That's our business. We are not the friend of anybody. You know, you, be, you have to be careful when the United States says, I'm your friend. Like the United States is telling Ukraine, we're your friend. You know, United States government. Friend means you will be destroyed. Good friend. So the United States is not a friend of anybody. You know, and I'm losing myself here. But what I, what I, I just want to focus on is how important it is for someone to stand up to the bully. Someone who has the spirit, and when I say someone, I'm talking about the Irish people, who have the spirit of resistance still in their hearts from centuries. That's not gone. Those people, the Irish people, who already believe for the most part in what you're standing for, you're just articulating it. You're articulating what's in the heart of the Irish people, of, this, of, of the citizenry. That's what you're doing, and it's fantastic. So if you can mobilize, if we can mobilize the Irish people to take a stand, to say no, and to say yes to peace, and to say no to war and everything that is, we have a chance. We have a chance. And I thank you so much. This means so much what you're doing and what you're standing for. So thank you. Thank you so, so much, Tarek. Thank you so much. You're getting a, a major uh, round of applause from those I can see on screen and lots of comments coming in there. It's a really powerful, stirring, rising address. And um, those of you, that, well, many will be aware of Tarek's um, great civil disobedience and protest actions in Ireland and went through a great oh. ordeal um, as well. So um, huge respect coming in for you for that as well, Tarek. And those that aren't aware of Tarek's actions, you might want to have a look at a Google his name online. It's T-A-R-A-K and then surname K-A-U-F-F. Um, definitely check him out online. He has uh, done Ireland a great service in helping raise the issue of Shannon Airport and militarism in general, as have all the speakers today. And that kind of brings us towards the end. And I suppose it brings me with an apology as well to say that the, the Q&A aspect just hasn't really gotten off the ground because the passion has been so dominant. So I won't apologize too much, but I hope people will be understanding and forgiving about that. I think we could, if we had the budget, like the state has the budget to be hiring, um, you know, we dare I say dames of the British Empire or any other member of the British Empire um, to be hosting uh, events and forums this week. But I think the conversation and debate will continue online and offline and on the streets, as Tarek says himself. And I'm going to invite Joe Murray uh, back from AFRI to say a few conclu concluding remarks and to thank everybody for the contribution. And just to let you know, we will be... Um, leading out with a song from uh, Tommy Sands that you might want to stick around from. If you're in the mood for some music and it might be an opportunity to digest some of the magnitude of what Tarek was talking about there and the emotion that he was sharing. And indeed the, the same true of John and Carol and Thomas and, um, and Karen and everybody involved, including Joe. So I'll bring Joe on screen and thanks again, everyone for joining. Well, thanks very much to everyone again, just to add uh, to, to the 
thanks that has already been said, and special thanks to Rory as well, whom I know is feeling unwell, but you might never have known by the professionalism with which he handled the event. Um, it's been a tremendous book launch, and really its importance is in the issue that it deals with. And, you know, there is no more important issue than what we're talking about here now, because I totally agree with Tarek that we're talking about the future of the planet. We're in a situation where two nuclear armed alliances are fighting a proxy war. Who would have thought that, that would be possible? But that's the militarist mind. Nothing is beyond their ability to achieve in their in their words. So it, it is up to us, the people, to put a spanner in the works, to assert the prominence of, of peace over war. Really, it's, you know, like Catherine Connolly said last night, war, peace has become a dirty word. You know, uh, the peace conference in Vienna was disrupted for talking peace. The International Peace Bureau website has been hacked because it said they would put the speeches on, on that website. So peace is a dirty word, but we, we must keep on using that dirty word, but not just using it, but working for it, working towards it. And, you know, like Ireland's voice needs to be heard again. The silence is shameful that there's no speak, no words anymore for disarmament, demilitarization, um, or the that, you know, Ireland has become another voice in the cacophony of voices supporting war. We've got to change that. It doesn't reflect our views, but the, the ruling class have, have taken our voices. So it's for us to, to find them again and to get our message through. And I think we're doing that and we will continue to do that. And maybe to encourage you, maybe, you know, the arts and music is a great way always of uh, communicating with people. And Tommy Sands is a wonderful troubadour, has always been. And, um, and this is a very powerful song that we're going to finish with. So I'll, mm. I'll ask you to stay with us and uh, stay with us uh, to hear the, the sentiments in this song. Yeah. And thanks again to everyone. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thanks, everyone. And um, thanks. Um, we have uh, just a, a comment coming in from Catherine Murphy TD as well. And I think we've had a few TDs joining us. Um, so great to have more legislators, but thanks to everybody equally for all the work that you're doing in the four corners of the land and beyond. Um, I do want to give a quick plug to Afri that you can order the book. It's afri.ie forward slash donate. You will be able to see the book there. I think it's only 10 euro, including postage. You're probably losing money on that, Joe, at that rate. But if you want to stick in an extra thousand or 10,000 uh, donation it will go towards great campaign work so um we're going to go over to tommy sands's song now and we'll say goodbye to everybody and wish all our speakers in particular uh great success and courage in all that you do and good luck karen thanks again and thomas and Tarek, carol john and joe i'll hand over to tommy sands and thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day hello my name is tommy sands and I'm delighted to be here. I suppose sometimes you have to revisit history and reimagine tradition and rewrite songs. A certain sense of Darwinism would suggest that it's a survival of the fittest that is important to arms and violence is part of it all. Interestingly, there was a research done by UNESCO a few years ago, and uh, they concluded that all, all down through the years, it wasn't the warrior tribes who survived, but those willing to learn how to compromise. Often as well, songs are interpreted like the answer is blowing in the wind, the great song written by Bob Dylan. Sometimes the interpretation is war, the answer is blowing in the wind, we don't know why. But then just a few years ago, I noticed on 
social media, where a British Prime Minister had gone to Egypt after the Arab Spring to give a lecture on democracy. And he didn't go alone. He brought with him seven arms dealers. So I thought the answer is not blowing in the wind. Just look behind the headlines. The answer is not blowing in the wind. And the question whispers in my mind. Take another look around behind the headlines. The answer stares you in the eyes. The answer stares you in the eyes. Times must a cannonball fly before they be forever banned? Well, they'll fly just as long as there's fortunes to be made by the wheelers and the dealers of arms and fellow profiteers who manufacture fear. To ensure that their wars will survive The answer is not blown in the wind no more The answer stares you in the eyes The answer is not blown in the wind And the question whispers in my mind Another look around behind the headlines. The answer stares you in the eyes. The answer stares you in the eyes. And how many times can the truth? Disguised in the guise of some patriotic lie. The media controlled, for to do what they're told, embedded in body and mind. Well, the truth has escaped past the sentries at the gate, a new way for news we can find. Is not blowing in the wind no more. The answer stares you in the eyes. And how many years can a mountain exist before it be swept to the sea? How many empires dissolve in the mist when the sea? There's nothing more to steal Invading, persuading that God is on their side Oh, God knows it's far from their mind The answer is not blown in the wind no more The answer stares you in the eyes The answer is not blown in the Question whispers in my mind. Take another look around behind the headlines. The answer stares you in the eyes. The answer stares you in the eyes.